Hey everyone, welcome to a brand new Digital Foundry Direct and this is it. This is where we shall find out uh, the key technical specifications of Sony's upcoming PlayStation 5 console. And uh, joining me, John Linneman. Rich, at last we have the details. The power is ours. <laughs> <laughs> well, is it indeed? Well, uh, let's talk about how this has all come about. So, long story here. Essentially, from what I understand, Sony was looking to do a developer briefing at GDC 2020 where uh, Mark Cerny would step up and he would address developers and talk about the kind of underlying philosophy of PlayStation 5 in far more depth than we've had so far. I mean, effectively, all we've had so far has been two Wired magazine articles uh, and a logo. And a logo. That's, that's basically, and the logo. Let's not forget the logo. That's been the extent to which Sony has uh, revealed its PlayStation 5 plan so far. So the idea was I'd fly over to San Mateo, to Sony's HQ, and talk to Mark about this presentation. COVID-19 meant I had to stay at home, which obviously immensely frustrating, but I did speak to Mark about this presentation on the Monday evening over video link. And uh, we're going to have a ton more on that soon. But fundamentally, today we're going to be talking about the content of this video presentation, which was originally slated to be uh, a GDC talk. So yeah, there's been a bit of an information void for a while now. And obviously, in the meantime, there's been a huge amount of rumour, speculation. The only leak that I considered to be in any way potentially valid was an AMD test leak that we saw in December, which was sourced from the summer. So there's a lot of stuff we don't know. I say a lot of the leaks have been off base. And in this talk, um, Mark Cerny delivers what I would say is a kind of like a, a personalized view of how he sees the PlayStation 5 innovations and how they will affect the gameplay experience and how developers can take advantage of these new features. So stuff like top line specs, the all important teraflop number, <laughs> it is in there, but that isn't really his focus uh, for this talk. But I kind of recognize that this is what you guys probably want to see first. So we shall talk about CPU and GPU clocks first. CPU wise, well, where do we begin? There's stuff that we know already. It's been officially confirmed that we're using AMD's Zen 2 architecture, uh, the Zen 2 CPU core, eight cores and 16 threads. I think that was confirmed a while back. We've got a clock speed now of 3.5 gigahertz capped. So what do you make of that, John? So based on the briefing, it does seem that they're going for a slightly more dynamic, uh, you could say kind of using boost clocks here. And there's, there's a rather interesting method they're using for determining the CPU and GPU sort of speed relation here. But uh, it is a rather bold move, I think, to aim for such a high clock speed. And I'm really curious to see now more than ever what the thermals look like on this box to be able to handle this kind of load. So yeah, 3.5 gigahertz capped there. There's a boost mode in effect. So this isn't entirely consistent frequencies. There's a kind of fundamentally innovative approach to what Sony is doing here, and it can't really be discussed in too much depth without addressing the GPU side of the equation as well, which is using exactly the same boost technology. So there we have RDNA2 technology. I think that was confirmed recently in an AMD briefing. 36 compute units, and they are running at 2.23 gigahertz capped. So yes, again, the boost clock is in effect there. Now, if we do our basic raw calculations, which is just, you know, ALU power, compute power, you get 10.28 teraflops of compute power there. And obviously this is pretty much in line with the leak that we saw, um, except I suspect that the boost clock was not actually being utilized there. And um, it's obviously lower than what some people were expecting based on some of the crazy, completely unsubstantiated leaks we've seen recently. So the boost clock. I think we've got to stress here and, and we've really got to stress it extremely strongly because boost is everywhere at the moment. In a mobile phone, you have a boost clock that basically increases frequencies until literally the device overheats <laughs> and you get performance that throttles back. And then we've got boost mode on an AMD GPU, which many people might think, well, you know, Sony would be using that. 
No, it's not. The way it works on RDNA is essentially that frequencies will adjust according to power, according to temperature, according to all manner of, of different variables that work within the GPU. Sony have got a very specific uh, implementation here, and it is tied to the thermal limits of their cooler, which Mark Cerny suggests will be an improvement over uh, the kind of acoustic performance we saw in PS4 and PS4 Pro. But anyway, rather than throttle according to silicon die temperature, it's more to do with throttling according to the power limit. Uh, so some workloads that you put on the CPU or the GPU consume more power than others. So just as an example, if developers want to use high power AVX instructions on the CPU, they can down clock to accommodate that to fit within the power envelope or possibly the GPU could down clock to accommodate that. So regardless, we've got variable clocks then uh, with the maximum on CPU being 3.5 gigahertz and the maximum on GPU being 2.23. So Mark Cerny told me that for the most part, we should be able to hit those top tier clocks. The power consumption is measured via what Mark Cerny called a model SOC, which is essentially a profile for SOC performance that's common to all chips. And what this actually means is that the same workloads will go through the same model SOC and produce the same outcomes, the same variable clocks. So yeah, developers will need to balance their code according to this power limit. And yeah, potentially you could see CPU downclocked to give more power to the GPU to hit that 2.23 gigahertz top speed. Uh, that particular part of the tech is derived from some fascinating work AMD has done for its new mobile chips. Uh, that smart shift technology, if you want to look that up. The key takeaway though, your PlayStation 5 should act the same whether it's in a fridge or a media cabinet. Ambient temperature will not affect performance. Oh, and another thing to stress is that there's no linear relationship between frequency and power consumption. So Mark Cerny told me that a 10% reduction in power consumption only results in a few percentage points lost in terms of frequency. Now, how this is actually going to impact developers, we don't know at this time, but obviously we're going to be digging into it. So to cut to the chase. Every PlayStation 5 console, even though it's using a boost clock, will act in exactly the same way, okay? And secondly, it's all repeatable. So developers can still target down to the fine grain tenth of a millisecond in terms of allocating their budgets when they're um, programming the GPU or the CPU. So yes, it is a form of boost clock, but it's very different to any kind of boost clock you've seen on the market today. So yeah, we are seeing the RDNA2 graphics core in terms of frequencies being pushed far higher than we've ever seen before. It's such an interesting and complex topic though, and it's, uh, it's a very different approach compared to what Microsoft has taken with Series X, where they focused on lower but sustained clock speeds and more compute units. This has fewer compute units, but they're pushing the clock speeds to some pretty crazy levels here. So it does kind of feel like we're looking at something that may balance out really nicely. And and by the way, you know, since we did mention the teraflop number, I do think it is worth reiterating again that there's a tremendous difference uh, in compute unit efficiency coming from uh, the previous architecture to our DNA 2. So, you know, I think in terms of like marketing and looking at the numbers, you can't really compare, say, oh, uh, the PS4 Pro was like a little over four T flops and Xbox One X was six or so. Uh, it's not that kind of a jump, right? It's it's greater than the numbers suggest. Yeah, you're entirely right, John. And um, typically, transistor density, you know, the amount of logic, gives a pretty good indication of how capable a piece of silicon is. And uh, according to Mark Cerny, a compute unit within PlayStation Five has 62% more transistors. It's 62% larger than a compute unit in PlayStation 4. So look, you know, you can't compare the teraflops. And in actual fact, they came up with this <laughs> astonishing spec point, which is essentially that if it was the same transistor count per CU, the PlayStation 5 would have 58 of them. I love that so one. Hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully that illustrates really what we've been talking about for quite some time now, which is that teraflops is a metric. It's not really equivalent to performance. One thing I can confirm, which I don't think was in the presentation, is that there is a 256-bit memory interface and 16 gigs of GDDR6. I think that bit was in there. 14 gigabit per second modules, 448 gigabytes per second, and that was in the AMD test leak. I want to talk a bit also about why Sony are pushing frequencies 
that insanely high. And um, Mark Cerny actually makes a really interesting point on that, uh, which is essentially that teraflops, again, it just sort of talks about compute on its own. It doesn't take into account any of the surrounding aspects of the GPU. So if you increase the frequency of the GPU, your caches have more bandwidth. Rasterization rate improves in step with the clock speed. So this is kind of like why they wanted to push the frequencies there, because you can get much more out of the GPU without having to go wider. So yeah, very innovative solution there. And as it is an RDNA 2 powered GPU, we do get to see new next generation features and some of which are shared with Xbox Series X and we presume the upcoming um, RDNA 2 graphics cards from AMD. So do you want to pick up the bat on there? Yeah, so obviously ray tracing is a part of this. It does have sort of the intersection engines and in, built into the compute units, I guess they said, designed to, you know, accelerate ray tracing. So that's in there. Uh, I believe we have mesh shaders in here as well, which they refer to if they are equivalent as um, primitive shaders. Is that right? Yeah, they call it the geometry engine. The geometry engine. <laughs> yeah, that's it, yeah. But it does seem to be carrying across a lot of the features we would expect to see in an RDNA 2 GPU. And uh, obviously we've had a briefing from Microsoft, it's in Series X as well, but you know, in terms of procedurally generating geometry, offloading a ton of uh, CPU and GPU work to that engine, uh, could be a game changer. I do see this as a next gen feature of the GPU that's possibly going to take developers some time to get to grips with, but I'm just loving that it's there. We do seem to have somewhat like feature parity, and I think there was some concern prior to release that we might have seen like an RDNA 1 based chip with sort of features grafted on, but it's great to see that it is the full fat experience, if you will. Yeah, you say that though, um, but there are a couple of features which they didn't talk about at all. Um, VRS, variable rate shading. Ah, uh, yes, that's true. We know that that's in uh, RDNA 2 on the GPU side, on the PC GPU side. We know it's in Series X. There wasn't any mention of it here. Same with uh, machine learning. Yes, exactly, yeah. I mean, with Series X, we saw basically support for 4-bit and 8-bit integers grafted onto the CUs, and uh, we didn't get any mention of that at all. So yeah, I do wonder the extent to which it's a full RDNA 2 GPU, but at the same time, again, something Mark Cerny stressed quite strongly is that this is a custom GPU. You will see features migrate into the PC space, and you'll see some of those features, obviously, in a competing console. But it is a custom GPU and certainly there's stuff in there closely related to how SSD data is handled that you will never see in a PC GPU part simply because, well, in a PC, the GPU doesn't directly interface with the SSD. I think before we jump over to that, I will say it is exciting for us specifically that we do have these custom parts with some variation. I was concerned that we would be looking at basically equivalent boxes, but it does seem that Sony is taking a very different approach to how they're handling this, which could result in some interesting findings. I agree completely. And this brings us on to another topic completely, which is kind of the focus of the talk, really. I mean, tech specs weren't really what Mark Sony was there for. He was there to deliver a vision. And it all starts with that SSD. Um, we've already had Microsoft's take on it. And obviously they're using an SSD as well. They have uh, 2.4 gigabytes per second of bandwidth and advanced hardware decompression engines to allow for kind of like a multiplier effect on bandwidth. But well, this Sony SSD, I think they've really pushed things so hard here and it's, it's fascinating. So, I mean, the key design objectives, let's take a look at the list here. They want games to boot in a second. They're kind of aiming for a situation where there will be no load screens whatsoever, where the SSD is producing so much data throughput that by the time you get like a fade to black and then a fade into the next scene, half dozen gigabytes have been uh, pumped into memory. Amazing stuff. Similarly, reloads when you die, they want to see an end to that. They, they want that to be instant. And uh, the classic example, fast travel. They want fast travel to actually be fast. They don't want to see Spider-Man on that subway train. I feel bad for the designer of that scene because, you know, everybody's always about getting rid of the subway scene. <laughs> but no, really, when Spider-Man was using as, as an example in that original Wired article, and specifically in that article, if you recall, they said that they're targeting a storage speed 
that's beyond anything available on the PC platform at the moment. And we were skeptical of this, but based on the specifications here, it seems that they've actually achieved that. And we're looking at a speed uh, or a transfer rate that is significantly higher than even the, the Xbox Series X. Yeah, so we've got a flash controller here, custom flash controller, 12 channel interface. 5.5 gigabytes per second, and this directly addresses the uh, the Flash NAND modules, which give a total of 825 gigabytes. So yeah, uh, it's not a one terabyte SSD, it's actually 825 gigabytes on the SSD there. We have six levels of priority. So when you're in game, you've got the SSD being accessed multiple times, lots of different chunks of data are being requested at any given point. Developers can attach priorities to that to ensure that the data that they need uh, right now gets priority over data that might be needed in you know a few seconds so that's pretty awesome the compression system they're using zlib that's what's used on current generation systems but they're also embracing rad tools kraken which i love the name <laughs> hardware decompression they expect from that 5.5 gigabytes per second the actual real data that will be flooding in probably more in the lines of eight or nine gigabytes post compression, nine gigabytes per second. This is what's very interesting then, because just having this sort of data transfer rate alone is not enough because you would sort of run into additional bottlenecks as Mark noted. And so they actually built additional silicon to support this, including dedicated DMA controller for managing the data. Uh, and they kind of said that was like the equivalent of an extra Zen 2 core, or maybe even two two cores. So it's sort of offloaded from that. But then they also have a coprocessor specifically for handling SSD IO. So it bypasses the more traditional IO and SSD reads that we have already. So the idea here that really fascinates me is they're, the way they're talking is they basically want to be able to treat the SSD like another pool of memory, almost as if it was like an old memory mapped cartridge and it could f fundamentally change the way that data is read and used within a game. Like you said, they want to bring it down so that you always have sort of like a one second window around you in terms of, okay, if I turn to the left here, I need to be able to very quickly access data from the SSD. And with the bandwidth and the custom hardware that they've implemented here, it really seems like it can just read from the disk almost as if it were just RAM and pull everything they need exactly as they need it just in time. And I really love the examples Mark gave about how it specifically impacts the way worlds are designed. Uh, he mentioned Jack 2 in terms of how the city was constructed, but fundamentally it hasn't changed that much. Like game worlds are built so that when you're streaming data in, it's never going to come at you so fast that the, that the drive and RAM and everything can't keep up. Specifically, worlds have to be crafted with this sort of IO limitation in mind right now, right? And that seems to apply to pretty much every game on the market, save for something like Star Citizen on the PC, which very specifically utilizes SSDs. But opening this up to console developers really kind of fundamentally shifts the way that game worlds could be built, the way that players could move through the world, you know, the ability to jump from scene to scene. Like there's so many potential uses that we've not really ever seen before. Uh, that this massive, massive boost in speed opens up. This is, for me, the most exciting point uh, of the whole presentation, honestly. Yeah, there's also the point of how efficiently memory can be used now with that SSD on top, even before we factor in the kind of instant access there. So in the current generation, because we're using a mechanical hard drive, there's lag in getting data into memory. Developers have to kind of preempt it. They have to use up a lot of memory to preempt the kind of data usages you're going to be having in the gameplay that's immediately in front of you. So the bottom line is that because so much is being streamed in and kind of like backed up, ready for use in the game, that actually results in a huge amount of inefficiency in how the memory is used because there's a ton of stuff sitting in memory that isn't going to be required until a little bit further on down the road. All of that can go with the transition to SSD. What we're seeing is almost instant access to that data. So although there's only a two times increase in available memory with PlayStation 5, it should be a multiplier effect. We should see that memory being used far more efficiently simply because data can be funneled in from the SSD far, far more quicker, far, far more immediately. 
and uh, more specific to the actual context of what's happening in the here and now, as opposed to what may be happening 30 seconds down the road. So yeah, this is pretty amazing stuff. It's also key to the fact that, the, that we're only seeing a 2x jump in terms of the amount of memory in the system, which is historically very low for the console space. But because of this new SSD technology, uh, this sort of offsets that issue entirely because you know the approach to how memory is filled can completely change. And we should also talk about expandable storage. This was a real concern of ours when we heard about this move to proprietary SSD. Now we've already seen Microsoft's solution to this, which is to team up with Seagate and produce these cute little memory card-like SSDs that plug into the back of your system. Now, obviously that means you're locked into a proprietary solution from Microsoft. Sony's solution is quite remarkable. <laughs> so they are actually allowing you to use off the shelf components, but there's a limit. So it needs to be a PCIe 4.0 based NVMe. And they are specifically, it seems like they're going to be validating specific drives to support this. And it's not just the speed requirements. It's also like the size and shape. For instance, a lot of SSDs or these NVMe drives, they ship with large heat sinks, they ship with fans, you know, there's different form factors that they have to consider. So what they're doing is validating specific drives, but the drives that are capable of these sustained transfer rates, they don't really exist right now, I think, in terms of they're not in the consumer space, so you can't actually buy one of these right now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So basically, um, when the first Wired article that Mark Cerny collaborated on uh, came out, we were told that this is a proprietary SSD. It's faster than anything in this PC space. So, you know, the automatic conclusion from there is, well, how are you going to handle expandable storage? But since then, we've had the advent of PCI Express Gen 4. We've got much more bandwidth now. And the drives are catching up to the performance level of Sony's internal solution. So Sony's internal solution there, 5.5 gigabytes per second. I think we're looking at drives that will hit 7 gigabytes per second in the medium term future. So throughput is faster than Sony's solution at that point. And it's needed because uh, I think I mentioned earlier that the PS5 SSD has basically six levels of priority on how data can be requested. Uh, typical NVMe, only two uh, lanes of priority. And this presents a problem. So you kind of need that extra bandwidth overhead because Sony's custom controller is going to be stepping in and kind of like enforcing six levels of priority on data access on drives that simply don't support it. So a takeaway that I had also from the talk that Mark Cerny gave is simply that, well, yes, the drives are theoretically going to be able to do this. We are going to have a slot in the PlayStation 5 where you can put in your own NVMe drive, but performance, well, we're going to have to wait until we have actual PS5 games to test to see whether the drives can actually cut it. But I do think this is a fascinating solution. It could be a bit of a challenge in the short term because simply the drives aren't there. But, you know, consider how long a console generation is, you know, five, six, seven, eight years. When you look at it from that perspective, an SSD that's going to appear, you know, two, three, four, five years later on down the road should easily meet the spec. It's just in the here and now that things are going to be interesting. Yeah, I got to hand it to him on this. It's kind of a smart, very consumer focused move to allow sort of like off the shelf drives like this. And I think it will pay dividends in the long term. The only question for me, and I guess the only real advantage as well that I could see still on the Microsoft side is that their solution with the custom cards allows you to swap them in and out as you please. Like systems on, swap one out, put the new one in, and it just immediately picks up what's on the drive. We don't yet know how that's gonna work on PS5, but I assume that it's gonna be a, a card that you physically insert through the back of the unit or in some bay like they've done before. And it's not gonna be designed to be removable 
you know, just as you want. You know what I mean? Like, it's going to have to be you insert it, it's set up, and you leave it in there. You don't move it in and out. Yeah, I think that's pretty much on the money there. It's similar to a, you know, a PlayStation 4 hard drive upgrade. You wouldn't expect to be taking that drive out and putting it in another unit. It just wouldn't work for starters. But yeah, that's kind of the advantage of the Microsoft approach is that if you've got X number of Series X units in your house, you can just take out the drive, take it into the, to the second unit, and you're good to go. So yeah, very interesting divergence. It is, I also have to laugh because a lot of people were comparing the Microsoft situation to the Vita memory cards, and Sony has uh, gone very much out of their way to avoid doing that <laughs> this time. So I wouldn't say it's quite apples to apples comparison there either, because you know, uh, the Vita situation was certainly special. But uh, it is interesting. I, I think this is a smart, cunning move on Sony's part, but they are going to have to find a way to make sure that it's clear to consumers uh, what they can purchase. Yeah, definitely. I think especially in the shorter term, that's going to be crucial because it's really unclear as to what drives are going to work right now. There's going to be some clear messaging required there. And, you know, I think there was also concern about how much the Microsoft proprietary drives are going to cost. I think that's a perfectly valid concern to have. All I'll say is that PCI Express 4.0 NVMe SSDs are not on the cheap side. No, none of this is going to be cheap. This is one of the things about embracing new technology. There's always a cost involved. But, you know, when you look at the advantages that the SSD is bringing to the table here, it's just... I think it's going to be huge. I'd actually be curious to know if you could insert a non-capable drive in that slot. Like if the PS5 rejects it, if it runs sort of a test to determine whether it's up to spec, or if you could just install to a low performance drive, just as sort of a worst case uh, scenario, just to see what would happen. <laughs> I think there's a certain quality of service you expect from a console game. So I would really expect the, the PS5 just to say, nope. <laughs> and, and ask you to, to replace your drive. I mean, I'm going to move on now to the final part of the presentation. Directly after I spoke with Mark Cerny last night, this was the, pretty much the first thing I told you because I just knew that you would be hugely excited by it. It's the 3D audio. Oh my goodness. <laughs> So you're a big audio fan here, and um, certainly what Mark Cerny was telling me was, you know, he visits developers all around the world, hundreds of developers, publishers. He sits down, he talks about their needs, but he was telling me that very few audio engineers turn up to these talks. So Sony has had to kind of take point on the a kind of next-gen vision for audio, and the solution that they've come up with, I'm kind of blown away by it. So what stood out to you? So they seem to be focusing a lot on head related transfer functions, which is sort of a measurement of, I guess, like the shape and the, the acoustics and physicality of each person's ear and the way that sound is translated from external to internal. This is a fascinating thing to me. I've already been kind of, for years, I was always obsessed with a binaural audio where you use a, a microphone embedded inside of a, an ear canal so that what you record with that mic, then when you listen to it through headphones, it really sort of replicates the same, like sort of, uh, I guess you could say physics of audio, if that makes sense. So that what you hear sort of replicates the original sound. So it genuinely sounds like you're there. Like what you hear is what you would hear if you were in the place where it was recorded. And using these HRTFs, they seem to be finding a way to sort of simulate that and not just with a high-end speaker system like say like Dolby Atmos setup like they want to find a way to map this to any speakers from TV speakers headphones sound systems whatever which is an interesting challenge but specifically with the HRTF stuff so they apparently ran different people in through a chamber they put microphones I guess in the people's ear canals and using sort of an array of speakers sort of measured the sound there and produced a graph if you will or it's almost like a fingerprint for each person so for PS5 they're kind of tackling this at least right away if I understand it sort of have different profiles out of the gate that you kind of choose from and they're considering things like sort of an audio test where the player will listen to a series of tests based on what you're told you should be hearing, you kind of pick and choose what's best for you. It's all really interesting and unexpected. And the concept though, I mean, the basic idea here is that it's designed to simulate 
true presence in audio, right? Like not just like surround sound, but really simulate what things sound like in real life using a, you know, a secondary source of playback. And beyond that, of course, as we'll discuss, they're also dedicating more hardware to it. I was especially amused when he was talking about how currently they basically have, I think it's like half a core or less on the Jaguar CPU to process audio, which I guess is kind of less capable than what they were had with the PS3 in the cell. They're dedicating more hardware as well to audio processing. So it's, they're taking like this multifaceted approach to sort of solve the audio problem in a way that we've not really seen before. Yeah, so let's talk about the underlying technology that's being used to deliver this because it really is quite remarkable. So essentially Sony took an AMD compute unit and they refactored it to work more like an SPU, <laughs> which is just mind blowing. The computational power of this audio block is equivalent basically to the entire Jaguar 8-core cluster in PlayStation 4. They want to support hundreds of sound sources uh, and obviously, you know, their directionality, their locality within the scene. They want to be able to map hundreds of, of sound sources. And, well, consider this. When rain is typically uh, presented in a game, it's a flat audio of rain. They want to kind of push it to the next level by mapping the position of individual droplets in the scene, which just sounds absolutely phenomenal. The rain example, this is how they aim to simulate presence. So, you know, obviously when you're standing about in the middle of a rainstorm, you aren't just hearing one audio source, you're hearing thousands all coming together. That's the kind of level of simulation that they want to add to audio here. Then there's the concept of locality. You know, where are all of these sources? Above you, behind you, to the left of you, to the right of you. If they can get that sorted in the game, it just adds much further to the immersion. And yes, the HRTF stuff is just absolutely mind blowing. They're trying to map acoustics to the shape of your head, to the shape of your ear. As you say, they've measured hundreds of people. They've come up with five standard settings. There'll be some kind of configuration tool that matches you to the closest HRTF that they've supported in PlayStation 5. But the end game is that they're gonna come up with some kind of uh, mechanism to actually map sound to your specific head, <laughs> your specific ear. I mean, this is just awesome. So they're talking about maybe you send them a photo of your ear and they'll use a neural network to assign an HRTF to that. Maybe you'll be sending them a video of your ears and your head. They'll make a 3D model of that and synthesize the HRTF. This is just absolutely astonishing. Now, at Digital Foundry, you talk a lot about audio, but we don't really concentrate on it in depth. And the reason why I suspect is, well, because Everybody has a different sound system. Everybody kind of gets a different experience. But what Sony is trying to do is to bring this technology to basically any type of audio system you might have. And I think the priorities to begin with are going to be headphones because fundamentally you have two speakers and we have two ears. So that's kind of like the easiest way to map the 3D audio. They're going to be then moving on to producing like virtual surround from a TV, which I guess is probably the number one way that console audio is presented. It's sad, but OK. <laughs> yeah, it is sad. And then they're going to be moving on to multi-speaker systems. But yeah, this is just absolutely amazing. They're calling it the Tempest engine. So 3D audio, I mean, this is potentially game changing. It's kind of very much linked to the experience of the game, taking that to the next level in a way that I don't think we've seen anybody approach on any kind of gaming system before. So yeah, pretty awesome stuff, right? Yeah, it's actually one of the things that has me most excited at the moment, to be honest. You know, I've been listening to Dolby Atmos soundtracks as of late in various films and certain games, and just that already is a huge boost towards creating sort of that spatial effect around you, but it's still not quite where it could be. And I still want to find a way to be able to hear audio that sounds equivalent to what you get with binaural audio, but without obviously those limitations. Uh, and it does sound like we're kind of getting that. And for those kind of watching actually that curious about binaural, uh, I do recommend checking out uh, Hellblade. 
because that is a game that does support that specifically. It's one of the few games, I think Corpse Party on the PSP or Vita supports this, but only for certain effects, but Hellblade actually uses it to great effect. So if you play the game with headphones, you'll get the effect of voices truly around your head, whispering in your ears, and it's just kind of a taste of what could be. But this is so ambitious. Uh, I really hope that they can pull this off, and I'm very, very excited for that. Yeah, the Dolby Atmos comparison is fascinating because um, that was an option for PlayStation 5. They chose not to pursue it because they didn't want to lock this experience to compatible hardware. And they wanted to be able to deliver hundreds of sound sources. According to Sony here, Atmos tops out at 32. Again, just next level, next gen stuff here. Massively exciting. Okay, so let's wrap this up. But one thing that I do want to stress is that we can't really go into the kind of granular depth that Mark Cerny delivered in his talk. So this is our reaction to the talk. It makes a lot more sense if you go ahead and watch Mark's talk in its entirety. Fascinating stuff in there. Uh, but that's all from us for now. Please do like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Uh, share if you do want to share it. Uh, ring the bell for instant notifications. And of course, the Digital Foundry Patreon. It's uh, your contributions that allow us to uh, produce the work we want to produce on our own terms. And you get access to pristine quality video downloads of everything we do. Uh, but that's all from me and John right now. Thanks for watching.